Hi, my name is Sherry Rigo. I am a program manager and trainer with the Washington State Resource Family Training Institute. Here with me today is Julie Gilo. Thanks, Sherry. It's great to be back with you again today. My name is Julie Gilo, and my husband and I are licensed foster parents and have been for almost 18 years now. We currently have six children residing in our home, ranging from the ages of 9 through 17. And I've been a trainer for the Resource Family Training Institute now for almost 10 years. Yes. It's great to have you here, Julie. Thank you. So this video is a short overview of a six-hour training called Children with Sexual Behavior Problems. The six-hour training is offered in all regions of Washington State. This video is intended to just give you a basic overview, to provide some education and guidance so that you can provide a safer environment for children who may have sexual behavior problems. Remember, you must always consult with your social worker and also discuss issues with your child's therapist. For a more in-depth training, you can go to our website and find a training in your area. Children with sexual behavior problems engage in behaviors that are not ordinary, they're harmful to themselves or to others, and they elicit concern in the adults around them. Sexual behavior problems are behaviors that result not from normal, typical child development, but from trauma, anxiety, or abuse in a child's life. Take a, second, take a second to think about some of the sexual behavior problems that you've had in the children in your home. This overview will briefly explain the causes of these behaviors and offer some practical ideas on how to handle these behaviors. But first, we'll begin with Julie asking some common questions. All right. So true or false? Sexually abused children have both emotional and physical reactions to their abuse? The answer is true. Children who have been victims of sexual abuse are often more likely to experience physical health conditions and problems such as headaches, stomach aches, so on and so forth. Victims of child sexual abuse report more school problems than non-victims. Victims of child sexual abuse are also more likely to experience major depressive disorder as an adult. Young girls who are sexually abused are more likely to develop eating disorders as adolescents. And children who have been sexually abused are more likely to develop alcohol and drug addictions. In addition, the emotional reactions to the trauma of the abuse may cause a child to develop sexual behavior problems. So another question, true or false? A child who is sexually abused always proceeds to abuse others. The answer to this is false. However, there is widespread belief that, chi that child sexual victimization leads to sex offending. Often it's referred to as the cycle of sexual abuse. And this myth is perpetuated in the media, in the court systems, and throughout child welfare literature. However, recent research does not support this belief. The following comes from the United States General Accounting Office. The GAO found that there was no consensus among 25 studies that were reviewed that childhood sexual abuse leads directly to the victim becoming an adult sexual abuser. Although some of the studies concluded that childhood sexual abuse may increase the likelihood that victims will commit sexual abuse later, most of the studies noted that the majority of sex offenders had not been sexually abused themselves as children. A final question, true or false? Growing up in a violent home may lead to sexual behavior problems, even if there was no sexual abuse in the family. And that answer is actually true. There are risk factors other than sexual abuse history. It, incidents of trauma that include physical abuse, neglect, and exposure to domestic violence almost universally appear in the histories of adolescents who later develop offending behaviors. It was not until the 1990s that the fields of mental health and child welfare paid much attention to the impact of trauma on children. Over the past decade, we've learned a tremendous amount about the impact that trauma may have on a child's development. Trauma is defined as a single event or series of events over time which can tax or overwhelm a person's resources and sense of well-being. Most of us have experienced some type of trauma in our lives, and our responses and recovery processes are all different. How an individual reacts to a traumatic incident 
is dependent upon a number of different variables. Some of these variables are the person, their age, their cultural background, their gender. The traumatic event itself, what happened? How did it happen? Were there weapons used? Were there threats made? Where did it happen? And the frequency, did it happen once, occasionally, or did it happen quite often? And also the environment. The support system that the child has, family and community response to the event, and the police response to the event. All are factors in how a child will respond to a traumatic event. For some children, a traumatic experience might cause sexual behavior problems either now or in the future. However, there are other risk factors as well. Next, we'll look at those risk factors that increase the likelihood of sexual behavior problems in children. So in addition to trauma, there are family risk factors that increase the likelihood of, child, of a child displaying sexual behavior problems. Family risk factors for children developing sexual distress and sexual behavior problems may include a history or current sexual abuse, domestic violence, physical abuse in the home. It could include exposure to adult sexual activity such as visually either in person or via the TV, videos and internet, as well as auditory or even participatory um, activities. Access to sexual materials including videos, magazines, 900 phone numbers, the internet. Extreme parental dominance, in other words the parent not allowing the child to either have friends or they keep very rigid control over the child's friends and um, present with extreme overprotectiveness. It might also include um, a child and parent being extremely enmeshed, having an unhealthy attachment between the parent and the child. This is often seen in single parent families. It, another risk factor is when secrecy is tolerated in the home, not only tolerated, but maybe actually encouraged, and where it's considered the norm in the family. Uh, having unclear family roles and unhealthy relationships uh, um, which allow a parent to involve a child in keeping secrets maybe from the other parent or having a parent confide to th things to a child about the other parent and then trying to get that child um, to take sides or having a child play one parent against the other which can often be called something called tri triangulation. Having special privileges given to one child over another, having unequal roles and unequal power among siblings and finally, unhealthy, rigid gender roles, where boys are expected to be stoic, self-sufficient, you know, never admitting that they feel powerless or helpless or that they're afraid of things, and having girls who are conditioned to being submissive and not question having authority of males in their lives. There are additional family risk factors, and these might include encouraging inappropriate adult roles for children outside of what is developmentally appropriate having the parent act jealous of the child, isolating either the child or the family from community and from supports, an extreme reaction to sex education or pregnancy prevention materials offered through schools and other community sources. A non-offending parent may minimize abuse allegations and actually then encourage the denial of those issues. Excessive use of alcohol or drugs can also be a risk factor for families as well as intolerance of, denial of, or lack of empathy for a child's fa and family's feelings and emotions. A lack of consequences for sexually or for sexual behavior problems and the covertly sexualized atmosphere seen in the attitudes towards nudity, privacy, toileting, bathing, sexual teasing, and so forth. Next, Sherry's going to talk about messages that children are um, given that are raised in these types of environments. Yeah, think for just a second, if you can, about being raised around the types of risk factors that Julie just talked about. What might be the messages or the impressions that children receive from being raised in a family like that? Well, one of those messages is probably around masturbation. A lot of times, kids have learned that masturbation is normal or they haven't learned any normal or appropriate boundaries around masturbation and so they have no respect for boundaries at all. 
Masturbation is done in public, anytime, anywhere, with anybody present. Or they may have learned that masturbation is strictly forbidden and will cause irreparable harm. They may not have learned appropriate and normal boundaries in any respect or have no respect for boundaries at all. Sometimes they've learned that sexual behaviors are the only way to get attention. They may have also learned that children don't have the right to say no, especially to bigger people or older people than themselves, and they also don't have the right to disagree. So think about how these attitudes or beliefs might translate into problems around sexual behaviors. Before we can fully understand what sexual behavioral problems are, we need to first take a look at what typical sexual behaviors are. This next section is going to be distinguishing sexual behavior from that which is typical or normal, those behaviors that we find in a typically developing child. Children are human beings, and human beings are sexual beings, so even very young children will display some sexual behaviors. We'll talk about those behaviors that are completely expected and completely typical in a typically developing child. For example, in children under five years of age, erection in young boys is not at all unusual or uncommon. Kids under five are also very curious about their own bodies and the bodies of others around them. They may be curious about their parents' bodies and they may want to watch their parents shower or undress. They're interested in the difference between boys and girls. They may be touching or rubbing their own genitals. Even very young children will fondle their genitals, and in the very young child, this is no different than a child finding its earlobe and playing with it or putting its finger in its belly button. Their genitals are just another part of their body, and this is how they learn, through exploring. They may use words without understanding their meaning. If this happens, it's very important for you to ask the child, do you know what that means, or can you tell me what that means? Because their interpretation of the world might be much different than your own. When my son was in kindergarten, he came home from school and he told me that he had been, at school, he had been French kissing. Well, that raised some issues for me. I didn't want my son French kissing at school, but I said to him, I said, Jack, do you know what that means? And he said, he said, yeah, I'll show you. And I said, no, 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 you're not going to show me. And then he said, I'll show you on Thomas, who was his younger brother. And before I could stop him, Jack went up to Thomas, and he took Thomas's hand, and he kissed the top of Thomas's hand, because that's what he thought French kissing was. So it's very important to ask them, tell me what that means before you react or respond to what you think it means. Children under five also may show their genitals to others. They'll play the I'll show you mine if you show me yours game. And they may also have a potty mouth. They may love using words related to bathroom functions or to body parts. Now remember, just because these behaviors are typical, they're expected, they're considered normal behaviors, that does not mean that they're appropriate. Even very typical normal behaviors may still need some intervention from you, the parent. So in children ages 6 to 12, it would not be unusual to see continued, continued fondling or touching of their genitals. Often many questions about pregnancy, birth, bodily changes during puberty, um, all of those are going to start coming up and, and arising now between the ages of, of 6 and 12. They might actually start pursuing more modesty and privacy, and so for the first time, they're shutting the bathroom door or the bedroom door when they're changing their clothes. You might start seeing some of the so-called dirty jokes, or you know, more again of that kind of potty mouth and, and talking about bodily functions. There might be the beginning of some flirtatious behavior, giggling and whispering, you know, about the other gender looking at books, diagrams, magazines, all in an attempt to try and get more information about their bodies um, and the bodies of others. In youth ages 12 to 18, it would be quite common to see continued masturbation, a heightened interest, of course, in relationships and in sex, viewing sexually explicit materials, and then experimentation with sexual behaviors but it's also very important for us to remember that um, sexual behaviors can include things as benign and simple as holding hands and all the way to as complicated and um, intense as sexual intercourse. 
Yes. So we do need to pay attention to what's normal, expected behaviors, and what's not. So here's a way that you might want to think about those. We'll talk about green light behaviors first. And green light behaviors are those behaviors that we expect to see or behaviors that don't raise any undue concern in us. So green light behaviors in children under 12 is exploration with children of a similar age or a similar size. And if they're exploring, they're doing it with friends or peers rather than their siblings. It's voluntary. There's no force. There's no threats. There's no coercion. And in younger children, the affect is very lighthearted, spontaneous, silly, excited. There might be some confusion or there might be a little guilt, but there's generally not shame, fear, or anxiety associated with it. Also in young children, sexual behaviors are balanced with curiosity about other aspects of their world. On the same day that they ask, where do babies come from, they might ask, where does the sun go at night? In older youth, sexual behaviors are not all-consuming, but do not or do not prevent them from participating in other social activities. Now, some behaviors may rise to the level of what we would call yellow light behavior, something that is a little bit more um, exhibiting more areas for concern. And some of those things could include preoccupation with sexual themes, especially themes that are pairing sex with violence. Attempts to expose other people's genitals, including pulling up the skirts of girls or pulling down their pants, pulling down pants of boys. Sexual graffiti, especially when it becomes chronic or it's impacting specific individuals. Frequent sexual innuendos, teasing, embarrassment of others. Precocious sexual knowledge or language in younger children. Preoccupation with masturbation to the exclusion of other activities. And then mutual masturbation or group masturbation. And these would all be what we would call yellow light behaviors. Exactly. Other behaviors are going to require adult supervision, confrontation, and possible thera therapeutic interventions. And we're going to call these red light behaviors. So some of these red light behaviors may be sexually explicit conversations with others of a significant age difference, touching the genitals of others, especially others who are of a significant age, size, or social maturity difference, degradation, humiliation of self or others with sexual themes, forced exposure of others' genitals, especially in the context of hazing, inducing fear, threats of force, coercion, intimidation. Still more behaviors that are going to require adult supervision and intervention, more red light behaviors are sexually explicit proposals and threats, including those that are in written notes, repeated or chronic peeping, exposing, use of obscenities, pornographic interest, rubbing genitals against others or objects, compulsive masturbation, masturbation task interruption to masturbate. In younger children, female masturbation that includes vaginal penetration would be a red light behavior. In younger children, simulated intercourse, humping with dolls, peers, or other children, oral, vaginal, anal penetration of other children or animals, forced touching of genitals, and in younger children, simulating intercourse with their peers unclothed. Other indications for the need for intensive therapeutic intervention may include the child or youth appears to be preoccupied with a sexual theme for extended periods of time, often with a confused or anxious affect. The child or youth appears to be secretive, anxious, or confused about sexual matters. The child or youth is angry, violent, or forceful in his or her sexual behavior towards others. The child is inserting objects or fingers into other children. The child or youth compulsively engages in sexual behaviors, does not seem to enjoy the activity, but keeps doing it anyway, or seems to be unable to stop. The child is engaged in sexual activity that's inappropriate for his or her age, such as intercourse or oral sex between young children, and the child or youth attempts sex with animals. Experts generally agree that sexual behavior problems are best understood on a continuum. We're going to look at a continuum developed by Tony Cavanaugh Johnson. Tony Cavanaugh Johnson defines four groups of sexual behaviors, normal sexual exploration, sexually reactive behaviors, 
extensive mutual sexual behaviors, and children who molest. We'll take a look now at, at each of these categories and see what they entail. So group one, normal sexual exploration. Children of all ages show normal sexual behavior based on the discovery and development of their physical and sexual selves. This may include exploration of feelings and genitals, interest in language related to sex, giggling about bathroom related functions, Children involved in normal sexual exploration may do it solitarily or with friends of similar age and size. They more often explore with friends rather than siblings. These encounters are voluntary, lighthearted, fun, and silly. They do not include feelings of deep shame, fear, or, anxi or anxiety. For teens, this often involves intense sexual feelings towards others and sexual exploration in relationships. These behaviors may need limits, they may need guidelines, they may need education, but they're not considered abnormal or pathological. So for example, we have three 10-year-old boys who are found in a bathroom at school, all with their pants down, all playing together, playing a game called who can pee the furthest. And they're standing as far as they can from the urinal to see who can still hit it with a stream of urine. This would be considered Group one, normal sexual exploration. The boys are giggling about bathroom related functions. They're with friends of a similar age and size. It's lighthearted, it's fun, it's silly. No feelings of deep shame, fear, or anxiety. It may still require adult intervention, but it's considered very typical behaviors. So group two would be considered sexually reactive behaviors. Group two exhibits more sexual behaviors than group one and has a preoccupation with sexuality. Many of these children have been abused or exposed to pornography and sexual stimulation. These children have trouble integrating and understanding such stimulation, and they express deep shame, guilt, and anxiety about sexuality. Their behavior focuses mostly upon themselves. When they involve other children, the difference in age is usually not great, and force is not usually involved. These children respond well to therapy and to education. When the anxiety is reduced or more age appropriate and less sexually stimulating environments are encouraged, the, less, or the level of sexual behaviors tends to decrease. So for example, four-year-old Jenna lives in a one-bedroom apartment with her mom, who's 19, and her mom's boyfriend. She often hears and sees her mom and her boyfriend um, having sex. Her mom treats her more as a friend than as a daughter. Jenna's mother lets her wear makeup and watches soap operas with her daughter all day. She has no age appropriate toys, she's got no same age friends, and Jenna's learned to climb onto the laps of men and to snuggle against them. She tries to stick her tongue into the mouths of people who kiss her, and she's made sexual noises. Now this would be group two sexually reactive behavior because Jenna has been raised in a very sexualized environment and she has a preoccupation with sexuality. She's been exposed to sexual stimulation and she has trouble integrating and understanding such stimulation or more appropriate boundaries. So group three would involve extensive mutual sexual behaviors. These children often approach sexual sexuality as just the way they play. They're more resistant to treatment than the other two groups. These children use coercion and manipulation, but they rarely resort to violence. They are characteristically without emotional affect. They have neither the lighthearted spontaneity of normal children, nor the shame and guilt of the sexually reactive children. They often have a history of severe abuse and abandonment. Sex is a way to relate to their peers. They need intensive and rigorous relearning of social skills and peer relationships. They will also need intensive supervision in the home setting and any time they're around other children. For example, Todd and Joey are both nine-year-old boys who are living in a group home. They've been in foster care almost all of their lives. They're constantly trying to engage each other in willing and mutual sexual behaviors, including touching and oral sex. The caregiver has to provide constant supervision and must keep the boys separated in order to stop the behavior. Night times must be monitored because they will sneak out of their bedrooms and climb into each other's beds. This is considered group three, extensive mutual sexual behavior, because their approach to sexuality is just the way they play. They may use manipulation, but they're not resorting to violence. 
They're without any emotional affect. They don't have that lighthearted spontaneity, but they also don't have any shame or guilt. Sex is just the way they relate to each other, and they need intensive supervision. The final group or level is group four, children who molest. Now it's very important for us to remember that this is a very small percentage of those children who are exhibiting sexual behavior problems. The children in this category go far beyond developmentally appropriate play. They are obsessed with sexual thoughts and they engage in a full range of sexual behaviors that becomes a pattern rather than solitary incidents. These children need intensive and specialized treatment. These children often link sexual acting out to feelings of anger, rage, loneliness, or fear. Children with severe offending behaviors choose vulnerable and younger victims. They lack compassion for their victims and they feel regret in getting caught, not with hurting another child. Most of these children have severe behavior problems at home and at school and they have very few friends. For some of these children, their behavior borders on compulsive behavior. Compulsive behavior means the child has lost control over it and has a very difficult time not repeating their actions, even when punished or when trying to stop. These children need therapy, strong intervention, combined at times with medication to control these impulses. For example, Frank is an 11-year-old boy who is in residential care, and he often bribes younger children to have sexual activity with him, including oral sex and forced penetration of a child's vagina or anus with his fingers. He can turn quite threatening with a vulnerable victim, threatening to never talk to him or her again, um, threatening to hurt them while they're sleeping, and so forth. Once when he was caught sodomizing another child, he angrily yelled at the residential worker that he wasn't doing anything wrong. Now this is group four, children who molest. Because Frank goes far beyond developmentally appropriate play, he's obsessed with sexual thoughts and he engages in a full range of sexual behaviors. He chooses vulnerable and younger victims and he lacks compassion for those victims. One of the goals of this training is to teach you a simple method for setting effective limits on problem sexual behaviors. Always, before intervening, remember two things. First, separate the child from the behavior. The, ch the behavior may be inappropriate or wrong, but that does not mean that the child is bad. And second, your role is to teach appropriate behavior, not to punish or to shame the child. So here is a six-step model of appropriate intervention. The first step is to manage your own reaction. Take a deep breath, count to 10, turn in a circle, do whatever you need to do to get yourself in control because you will respond better when your feelings are under control. Step two, neutralize the behavior. Now what I mean by that is to take the sex out of the behavior. Children in care have a lot of inappropriate behaviors and sexual behaviors are just one more. So instead of seeing this behavior as a sexual behavior, just see it as one more inappropriate behavior. And this will help you to manage your own reaction. One way to neutralize behavior, the second step, is to think of something like picking your nose. If you had a child, or let's think of it like this, if you have a child that's sitting at the dinner table and they're eating their dinner with their one hand and with their other hand it's under the table and they're masturbating at the dinner table, well that's not okay. And if I asked you how you felt about that you would probably think things like, yikes, that's gross, that's disgusting, I don't want to see that, you don't do that in public, and that's all true. But imagine, same situation, you're sitting at the dinner table and you have a child who's eating his dinner with one hand and with his other hand he's picking his nose. Well, same thing, that's gross, that's disgusting, I don't want to see that, you don't do that in public. But we, we, we tend to react to a child picking his nose in a much different way than we react to a child masturbating. So try to take the sex out of the behavior and think of it as just another inappropriate behavior and then you'll have a calmer reaction. So the third point, after managing your own reaction, neutralizing the behavior to help you manage your own reaction, the third step is to stop the behavior. Tell the child to stop. Remove the child's hands. Separate the children. Have the child pull their pants up. Whatever it takes to stop the behavior. 
Next, define the behavior and describe specifically and clearly what the child is doing that's not okay. Instead of saying, stop doing that, to which the child will respond, what? What am I doing? So instead of saying, stop doing that, you'll need to be very clear and specific and say, please don't touch your private parts in the living room, or please don't put your hands in your pants when there are other children around. Be very clear in what you're saying. And lastly, state the house rule or I'm sorry, second to last, state the house rule or the expectation of this behavior. Don't lecture, but state matter-of-factly with as few words as possible. In this house, we keep our hands out of our pants, or in this house, we don't touch our private parts in the living room, or we expect everyone in our family to and follow up with whatever it is you expect. And then lastly, redirect the child. Let him or her know what you expect them to do and, if necessary, reinforce re a consequence. For younger children, you can re redirect the child to more appropriate behavior. You can ask the child to, if the child's masturbating at the dinner table, you can ask them to please get up and go wash their hands, and then when they come back to the dinner table, they'll need to keep both hands visible on the table. If the child is older and the behavior is repetitive, you may wish to set up a consequence, but remember the consequence is not to punish the child, but to make sure that everyone is safe. So the consequence may be as simple as, if you can't play with the other children without pulling your pants down, then you can't play with the other children. So the consequence in this sense is that the child must be separated from the other children. So let's again look at how this might work. Great. So, as an example, you're reading to Johnny, a little boy of six years old, and he begins to rub your breast. So the first step is going to be to stop the action. You're going to remove Johnny's hand from your breast, and you're going to move away from him slightly. The second step is to define the behavior. You're going to look him in the eye and very clearly say, John, you are touching my breast. Third um, step, state the rules. Johnny, in our house, we, you know, don't put our hands on other people's private parts or, you know, it's not okay for kids and adults to touch each other's private parts. Mm -hmm. Step four, redirect the child or, in some cases, apply a consequence. You know, Johnny, I love to read to you, but if we're going to continue, you can sit next to me, but, you know, you have to keep your hands in your lap. Another idea might be that for this young child, you can get a book on good touch, bad touch, mm -hmm. um, and you can set aside time to read that to them. Um, and you might need to read that several times, more than once. Repet repetition is often good. Find times to restate the rules at other times when it's not a problem. So just throughout the day, including, I think it's especially important to notice the times when they are behaving appropriately, when they are touching good, um, and to reinforce those. Ask the child for permission to touch. Um, you know, is it okay for me to give you a hug good night tonight? Mm -hmm. Is it okay um, for me to, you know, um, pat you on the shoulder? So asking the permission gives them that sense of, of privacy as well as giving them some power and control by giving them choices. For a child that's easily stimulated, you might need to really be careful about um, how much opportunity you give for them to sit on your lap or to have how they're sitting with their head level perhaps at your breast level and then keep some space between you and the child and that might be again as simple as each person sits on one cushion of the couch. Oh perfect. Great. Well let's look at another situation. In this situation your 15 year old daughter comes into the room and sits next to you, her foster father, as you're reading the paper. She sits down next to you and she presses her thigh into you and her breasts are pressed into you as she leans over to look at the paper with you. Step one, stop the action. So you would immediately move away from her and turn to face her so that you're face to face. Step two, clearly state what she is doing. I don't like it when you're in my personal space. You're a little too close to me right now. You've invaded my personal space. Step three, state the rule. In this house, we don't get that close to people. We make sure that when we sit down, there's some space between each person. That's how we do things in this house. And step four, redirect or apply a consequence. I like being with you, and I like reading the paper with you, but I'm uncomfortable when you're that close. So how about we put a pillow right here, and you sit next to the pillow, 
and then we can go ahead and read the paper together. Other ideas, older teens need a lot of open communication. They've got a lot of questions, they've got a lot of concerns, and if they're not coming to you, then where are they getting that information? They're probably getting it from the media or from their peers. So make sure that you have open communication with teens. When you feel uncomfortable with a touch, make sure that you address it in a very assertive way. This is excellent role modeling to show the kids that they have a right to say no as well. Don't be surprised if teens get defensive or angry. That's okay. You still need to talk to them about these issues. So another situation, another scenario. You hear giggling in the bathroom, and when you open the door, you find five-year-old Lori rubbing her vagina up against four-year-old Sandy's buttocks as she brushes her teeth. So to, both of the children are laughing, but we're going to follow those steps again. So the first one, step one, we're going to stop the action. You're going to tell the girls to stop what they're doing immediately, and you're going to separate them. You're going to put one on one side of you and one on the other side of you. You're going to define the behavior. Lori, when I opened the door, I saw you rubbing your vagina against Sandy's buttocks. That's not okay. Step three, state the rule. An important rule in our family is there's no sexual touching. And that includes what you were doing, which was rubbing your vagina against Sandy's bottom or buttocks. That's sexual touching, and that's not okay. Step four, you're going to redirect the children or if, apply a consequence if this is not the first time that that's happened, if this is a repetitive behavior. You might say, come on, Lori. You know, the rule is one person in the bathroom at a time. We'll let Sandy brush her teeth, and when she's done, then you can come into the bathroom. But meanwhile, you and I will go and find something fun to do. Mm -hmm. Then the another final idea is, you know, maybe to emphasize that both girls um, need to follow and enforce the rules. Maybe you put pictures up as reminders on the door, one person at a time. And increase your supervision of the girls and uh, make sure that everyone understands that doors remain open when children are playing. Okay, great. And one more example that we would like to give you. Your 14-year-old foster daughter and your 12-year-old foster son are wrestling and tick tickling each other on the living room floor. They had gone in there to watch a movie together, and when you come in, you find them wrestling and tickling. So what do you do? Step one, you stop the action. You tell the kids to stop, and you ask them each to stand up. Step two, you define the behavior. You kids were wrestling on the floor. You came in to watch a movie, but when I walked in, you were wrestling on the floor and tickling each other. Step three, state the rule. Wrestling and tickling are not allowed in this house. They can, use, they can lead to touch that hurts or touch that becomes sexual, and that's not allowed in this house. Step four, redirect the child or apply a consequence. Let's brainstorm some ideas for something else the two of you can do together. Or the consequence may be, if you can't watch a movie unsupervised, then I'll sit in here and I'll watch the movie with you. Other ideas. Teens need plenty of opportunities to talk about feelings and relationships, but they may be hesitant to ask questions. So make sure you offer the time and make sure you bring up the topic, emphasizing boundaries, responsible behavior, and respect for others. When talking to teenagers who have been sexually abused, you must I'm sorry, when taking in teenagers who have been sexually abused, you might want to consider taking in only boys or only girls. Mixed sex foster homes often bring more challenges in supervision and safety than do single sex foster homes. Okay. Part of your role as a caregiver is to have open discussions with children about their lives, about their experiences, including their sexual behavior problems. Being able to openly and completely talk about sexuality, use appropriate terms, and answer any questions that they have. As a caregiver, you have a dual task. First, you need to provide support and guidance for normal, typical sexual development. But secondly, you need to provide intervention and corrective education regarding abnormal sexual behaviors. Children need clear information at their own level they need to know the names and the functions of body parts. They need to understand the changes that occur during puberty. They need to understand reproduction, birth control, and personal safety. 
You can help kids get this information through talking with them, reading a book to them, watching videos with them, or talking to other people like doctors, nurses, teachers, or therapists. Stereotype sex roles sometimes give children wrong information. Children need to know that both males and females can be tr strong, can be sensitive, can be caring and independent people. Being male does not always mean being in control, being the protector, or being macho. Being female does not always mean being weak, being a natural victim, being frilly, or being unable to say no. Children need to know that being victimized does not mean that they are damaged or less valuable, helpless, or hopeless. A child's inner value does not depend on whether they're a male or a female or whether or not something bad has happened in their life. An important part of sexuality is knowing how you feel, what you feel, knowing what you want, what you don't want, what you need, and how to express it. Having the self-esteem, the confidence, the knowledge of your own boundaries and rights, and the skills to say no. Another important aspect is to respect the feelings and the boundaries of others. Some suggestions for prevention education are teach about different kinds of touch. Even young children understand that some touch hurts, pinching, biting, hitting, and is not allowed. Some touches feel good and are good to give, such as hugs, kisses, handshakes. Other touches may either hurt or feel good, but are not okay. These include when people touch you in your private places or force you into sexual touch. This message can be, be presented differently depending on the age of the child, but it is a good message for all ages. There are many books and videos addressing this topic that can supplement your message. Sexual touching is not allowed and neither are touches that hurt others is a rule that should be repeated often. Secondly, role play and or set up a safety plan. If a child has an ongoing problem with touch, help him set up a practice plan for the next time. Ask them about their feelings and practice a set of responses, such as, when I want to hit, I'm going to hit a pillow instead. Or, when I feel like I want to kiss, I will ask you if I can have a kiss. Another idea for prevention, use the idea of personal space to reinforce boundaries. For young children or ch children with learning delays, use very concrete exercises that may help them with the idea of personal space. For example, have the child stand inside of a hula hoop and explain to them that that is their personal space, that is their personal bubble. Nobody is allowed inside that space without their consent. And likewise, they can't step into somebody else's personal space or personal bubble without that other person's consent. Don't forget about regular sexual education. Talk with children about changes in their bodies and their sexual feelings. As children change, so does their need for information. Make it okay for them to ask any questions of you. Offer birth control information and offer information on sexually transmitted disease prevention. Next, we're going to look at maintaining safety at school and in the community. As caregivers, we often feel a conflict, I think, between confidentiality as well as the public's right to know um, about potentially dangerous behaviors. When your child has sexual behavior problems, what do you tell the neighbors or the school or the church or the other people in your family? Review of Washington State's confidentiality rule says that information about a child or the child's family is confidential and must only be shared with people directly involved in the case plan for a child. You may discuss information about the child, the child's family, and the case plan only with a representative of the department, including staff from DCFS and DLR, Department of Health, and the Office of the State Fire Marshal. B, a child's placing child placing agency case manager that's been assigned to the child, the child's assigned guardian ad litem or court appointed special advocate, or others that are designated by the child's social worker. You may check with your child's social worker for guidance about sharing the information with the child's teacher, their counselor, doctor, the respite care provider, any other professional or others that are involved in the case plan. 
The school setting is a place in which there's often a lot of confusion and uncertainty regarding how much information to share and when it's important to, um, to give the, the school the information to provide um, more adequate supervision. But you have to counter that with the child's right to confidentiality and privacy. The child's right to confidentiality must be balanced with the school's right to know the information that will help them to do their job in keeping that child and other children safe. As a general rule, the more serious that the child's um, the more serious the child's safety problem, the more likely it is that the school is going to need to know information. Add to this the issue that a child is likely to seek out ways to manipulate their way around the rules, um, and then the responsibility to properly inform the school may become even more compelling. For some children, and more likely with adolescents, there might be a need to restrict certain activities in the school setting even if you don't need to restrict those, ish those settings within um, or at home. Um, if the clinical assessments and the child's current behavior indicate that there might be a risk of that child or youth involving other children in sexual behavior other than what is normal um, or healthy sexual exploration, then the following safety precautions probably should be considered. You may want to inform the caseworker and coordinate with him or her a request to meet with the appropriate school officials, such as the guidance counselor and the principal or assistant principal. Ensure that the proper release of information forms have been signed by both the caseworker um, and anyone else that's appropriate to disclose that confidential information, and then make sure that you document this meeting. Let it be known that the child has a safety plan that should be followed at school. Have a copy of the plan as it relates to the school setting. This usually involves creating a separate document for this purpose. Make sure that the plan is in writing. Have the plan appear to fit into the general routine of the classroom as much as possible rather than to make the child stand out or appear different. It's not necessary to provide a copy of the comprehensive psychosexual or psychological assessments to the school. Um, a copy of the safety plan is usually sufficient. Now the school may ask for that assessment, but it's not necessarily considered um, your place to um, share that information and you may need to ask the, a guardian whether that's appropriate or not. It's usually sufficient to indicate that the child has a safety plan due to problems with impulsivity or boundaries or keeping their hands to themselves. It's useful or um, if it's useful or necessary to be more specific, then proceed with indicating that the child may have a touching problem or is sexually reactive, has been sexually abused, or engages in inappropriate sexual behaviors. Diagnostically, this could range though from something like ADHD, post-traumatic stress disorder, or obsessive compulsive disorder, or oppositional defiant disorder. Do not tell the school that your child is a sex offender as this is a label and not a diagnosis. Based on the safety plan for the child, it may or may not be necessary to have specific activities limited or restricted. Again, this would be determined on a child-by-child -child basis. For example, children with some serious problems um, may need some um, restrictions or limits, such as line-of-sight supervision. There might need to be some modification around PE classes, where does the child change clothes, or whether they shower or not. Um, modification of bathroom times, whether or not the child needs to be escorted to the restrooms with an adult standing um, outside the doorway. These modifications are generally easy to implement um, within elementary school settings. They get more difficult when the kids reach middle school or high school years. If your child does have a safety plan um, and it's being monitored by the school, this plan may involve certain limits or restrictions. And I would request then regular review meetings, check-in times to see how things are progressing, and also to make sure that you're properly documenting and um, making adjustments to the plan. This would most likely be beneficial for everyone involved, but especially for the child. The school might need to know that the parent remains active and interested in the child's participation, and that progress within the school setting is important to the parents as well. This is an issue that cannot just be given to the school to deal with um, in isolation of the other areas of the child's life. 
It's also very important to build a relationship with all the key people at the school and to maintain open and frequent communication. Children participate in, that are participating in the community are typically supervised, particularly if they are in a foster care placement. But even still, many children are going to require um, maybe more supervision, and at least initially, and then be given the opportunity to, to earn back or to have progressive privileges um, in the community given to them. So children with special needs may require a safety plan um, in all settings, adjusting the manner that's consistent with their participation, um, including sports or um, job situations, other things out in the community. Limits in one setting will generally lead to limits set in other settings. In fact, it's quite likely um, as well that as a child makes progress in one setting, that that also then can extend to progress in other settings. Um, as a general starting point, I would say children who are new to a foster care placement, who need a safety plan, um, and who most likely would have the same rules you know, apply in all settings, um, that we should start with some very tight and consistent rules and then look at expansion or refinement later based on um, progress and, and a relationship being built. Situations that are arise out in the community that need attention and problem solving relative to safety management um, and supervision could be, for example, things like social activities it, um, as far as school dances, um, after school events, social and recreational clubs, boys and girls clubs, school and sports activities, and things like Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. It's very important to have a safety plan, not only at home, but out in the community as well. So let's look for a minute at how you might devise a safety plan. There are some steps to use in creating a safety plan. The first step is to define the problem, be precise and clear with the definition. For example, the problem might be that Max inappropriately touches himself while watching television in the family room. Number two, be clear about who needs protection. Is it the child? Is it other children? Is it pets? Is it your property? So in this case, it might be that Max's behavior is inappropriate for the other children and family members in the home. The third step, pinpoint when the behavior occurs, if possible, and if it's predictable. Does it happen when bedroom doors are shut while others are in the room? Or when the child's left unsupervised, when the child's Told no, does it happen before or after visits with the family while doing mindless activities or does it happen at night? So in the case of Max, it happens when he's watching TV in the family room. So number four, determine who is involved in the plan. Determine which adult is going to do which action. Remember to share the plan with all caregivers, including short-term babysitters. We need to have consistency in dealing with sexual behavior problems. So in our case with little Max, mom or dad will redirect Max by giving him a stress ball whenever he starts to inappropriately touch himself while watching TV. You might want to set a time limit for the plan. How long will your plan be in place? How often will you reassess your plan? What changes are you looking for? And number six, what do you do if the plan fails? If your preventative measures don't work, have a list of crisis numbers to call. Consider calling a therapist or the social worker. Be prepared to report incidences to your social worker, especially those that you see as pretty serious. If the child's behavior is a crime against another child, it is mandatory for you to also report that to the police department. Reevaluate and ask yourself some questions. How did your plan fail? When? What can you do better? What did you overlook? So next we're gonna look at setting up some rules in your house to keep everybody safe. So foster parents and other caregivers should be aware of the importance of offering a safe environment for children with sexual behavior problems as well as assuring the safety of other people in your household. So house rules make expectations very clear. They're there to assure the comfort and the safety of all family members. When children grow up in, with us from birth, they're um, able to internalize the unspoken expectations. They know the rules and the reasons for it. We don't have to go over them all of the time. But when children come into our home as foster children, 
they may have actually internalized a completely different set of rules um, and often very inconsistent ones as well. And there needs to then be some expectations of a foster home spelled out and spelled out very, very clearly. So here are some suggested house rules. The first one is privacy. To help children learn the importance of boundaries, emphasize that everyone in your house has the right to privacy. This might include a private spot, their own dresser drawers to keep their um, belongings, it might be that you don't go into anyone's room without permission, that you knock when doors are closed, and that you ask permission to enter. For you as the caregivers and the parents, I would especially um, support that you not search dresser drawers or read diaries without permission. Family members are treated in a respectful and caring manner. Your family and you may need to model and teach what this means continuously. Don't assume that a child is just going to automatically know how to do this. Sexual advances to others need to be, um, it, the message needs to be very clear that those are not accepted. Another um, family rule would be around supervision. Children with sexual behavior problems must have continuous eyesight supervision by an identified responsible adult that's knowledgeable about their issues. This is not a responsibility that should be shuffled on to another child in your home. Um, inappropriate sexual behavior um, is dealt with at the time that it occurs in a very respectful, direct, but firm manner. During adolescence, there may need to be some adjustments around supervision um, that will allow for more age appropriate or developmentally appropriate social interactions and peer contact. Um, teens are going to need to have opportunities to progressively earn freedoms um, by demonstrating responsibilities, but still always keeping in mind that they need to be safe and so do others. A house rules around the bedrooms. Children should sleep in their own beds and not share bedrooms. Um, monitors or door alarms may be placed on the bedroom doors of children who have problems staying in their beds at night or in their rooms at night or following the safety rules. But it's very important for you to always check and clear that with the child social worker before placing those monitors and alarms on the child's door. A child may be able to earn privileges um, of having a roommate or overnight guest as they demonstrate responsible behaviors. Um, except in the case of very young children, you know, there should always be the um, opportunity that, or the privilege of family members knocking on the doors before entering bedrooms. Um, care should be given when tucking children into bed at night. For some children, it may be more appropriate if their anxiety around the foster parent um, and bedtime routines is very high that um, the good nights or the sweet dreams be um, stated or said from the doorways rather than in the bedrooms themselves. Um, Playtime with other children should not take place in the bedrooms themselves and um, again giving the children the opportunity to leave a night light on or a choice of having their door left open or closed as you know they prefer. House rules around issues of the bathroom would include things like only one person in the bathroom at one time, except if there's a young child who may need some supervision or assistance from an adult. Knock to let someone know that you need to use that bathroom and that doors should always be closed when toileting and showering and that children should be washing their own private parts for baths and for showers. Around clothing, expectations would be and include, it's a good idea um, to require all members of the family to wear bathrobes or sweatpants when they come out of their bedrooms in the morning. Walking around naked um, or partially naked or clothed or in your underwear may cause embarrassment or anxiety for some children. It also may arouse children who are prone to sexually acting out. Identifying appropriate dress for all members of the family. Children should always um, wear underwear under their clothing and not wear clothes that have holes near their private parts. Expectations and house rules around horse play may include reducing or eliminating horse play such as tickling and wrestling. 
While these behaviors are not bad in and of themselves, tickling can be coercive, and wrestling is often the starting point for more intimate behavior. Children with violated boundaries may feel anxious or coerced during wrestling. Other times, children may use the guise of wrestling or tickling as an excuse to sexually touch other children. Sexually abused or acting out children may find wrestling to be quite sexually stimulating as well. And so instead of wrestling, channel the children into lots of other physical activities that are more appropriate. House rules around sexual talk. Monitoring sexual talk and gestures between children is very, very important. Talk openly about sexual matters, of course, but make sure that it's developmentally appropriate and respectful. It's important not to treat this as a, as a secret topic, but children who sexually molest others have often learned to groom their victims by using sexual talk. So really keep tabs on what's being said between um, uh, the children and youth in your home especially if the, the sexual talk is being used in an aggressive or demeaning manner. Keep to a minimum the presence of sexually stimulating, sexually stimulating materials. And this doesn't just mean hard pornography. We're talking about the effects of the media in many other instances, just television shows, commercials, um, video games that our children are playing, the music that they're listening to, magazines, and so forth. Be aware that violent and aggressive and stimulating television shows and video games um, can often raise the tendency towards aggression in children and may actually temporarily at least um, link to sexual stimulation as well. Talk to the children about what's appropriate um, and supervise your children closely in regards to um, the things that they're watching and listening and observing. For personal touch and personal space, I would really encourage the caregivers to not automatically assume that it's their right, their right or their due to um, be able to uh, receive hugs and kisses or um, being able to tuck their children into bed at night. I think it's a good opportunity to teach our children that they have the right to say no um, to anyone, including their moms, their dads, their grandmas, their grandpas, the uncles, etc. And so that part of that process can be a role-playing mechanism to teach a child that they have a choice or respect and the right to say no by asking your child, wow, I'd really like to tuck you into bed tonight, is that okay? And if your child says no, then we as the caregivers need to be able to non-judgmentally and very appropriately say, okay, that's all right, I'll ask you again tomorrow night. Now that's not always an easy thing for some of us who were raised in that kind of era of guilt and shame where, you know, everybody was supposed to kiss grandma and Uncle Fred goodbye when they came to visit us. And if we didn't, we were often told things like, well, grandma will never come back to see you again, or Uncle Fred, you know, won't give you another doll, or they're going to cry all the way home. I think it's very important for us to remember that we need to be giving our children the right and the opportunity to say no to all people. Finally, a house rule around physical punishment. We all know that foster parents are not allowed to use physical punishment with a foster child. They're not allowed to use punishment that is cruel and humiliating. This includes responses, though, to sexual behavior problems. Do not use pepper restraining devices, slapping, humiliating, or hurtful consequences when addressing a child's sexual behaviors. One of the big concerns that foster parents always have when working with any children, but especially children with sexual behavior problems, is the threat of allegations being made against them and the care that they're providing for the child. By establishing and following some clear house rules, like Julie was just talking about, you can minimize the risk of allegations being made against you. Here's a checklist that you might want to follow to minimize that risk of allegations. First, keep, make sure your behavior is above reproach. Do not sexually abuse, sexually touch, physically abuse, spank, or use suggestive language with the child. Keep your behavior above reproach. Number two, secure accurate information upon placement of a child. Ask why the child is being placed. And if possible, discover what the triggers are for that child. For example, if you learn that a child is being placed in your home because somebody has been taking pornographic pictures of that child, you're not going to say as that child walks in the door, oh, honey, smile, I take a picture of everybody when they come to my house. 
Or also, you might have a child that has sexual behavior problems. Imagine that we have a young girl, um, well, a preteen girl, but she's been babysitting younger kids. And while babysitting these younger children, she would offer to brush their hair and to comb their hair and to braid their hair, but that would very often lead to her then fondling them and touching them and molesting them. So she comes to your home, and one of the things that you'd say is, oh, honey, come here, you have beautiful hair. Come here and let me comb your hair. And she can misinterpret that as sexual behavior because that's why she's, that's what got her in trouble, was combing somebody's hair that led to other behaviors. So if possible, find out what the triggers are and find out exactly what happened to this child so that you can avoid those situations that might cause discomfort for the child in your home. Thirdly, use the rule of three, especially if the child has a history of sexually acting out or if the child has a history of making allegations, then try to always have three people in the room. This might be two adults and a child, or this might be two children and one adult, but so that there's always somebody else there to give their idea or their opinion as to what happened. Next, as Julie said, put the foster child in their own bedroom. Also, as Julie said, do not use physical punishment. Also, Again, be clear about rules of dress, privacy, and touching. Record any sexual acting out behavior in writing and send a copy of this report to the child social worker or therapist and keep a copy for yourself. Use family and group therapy rather than confidential individual therapy with the child. The secrecy and isolation of one-on-one -on -one therapy may encourage manipulative reporting in a child who has a history of false allegations. Reduce your stress. When you are caring for difficult children, schedule in a regular break for yourself. Take care of yourself. You must monitor your own emotional stress and get help when you need it. Address issues when they happen. And as Julie said, avoid aggressive horseplay, teasing, suggestive, or ambiguous language. One of the things that's most important for you to do as a caregiver is to provide a safe and healing home for children. And there are three things that you can focus on in providing that safe and healing home. Nurturing, providing choices for children, and establishing rules and boundaries. So for example, when we talk about nurturing, when many of us think of nurturing, we think of holding a child and snuggling a child and rocking with a child. And for some of our kids in care, that would be very inappropriate. It may be inappropriate because the child actually finds that sexually stimulating, or it may be inappropriate because that might be very scary for the child. So you need to always think of other ways that you can nurture a child. What else can you do for that child that doesn't involve hugging, touching, rocking, holding? What are other nurturing activities that you can do? You should try to think of nurturing activities for all areas of your home, whether it's playing a board game together or reading to the child on the couch, or having pizza and watching a movie. But try to build in nurturing activities that don't involve touch that may either be stimulating or frightening. Providing choices is another way to offer that safe and healing home. A lot of our children in care feel powerless. Every time we offer a child a choice, we're offering that child some power. Also, children with sexual behavior problems often feel powerless and use their sexual behavior problems as a way to gain power. So if we can offer them appropriate power instead, maybe they won't need to get it through inappropriate means. So offer choices at every opportunity. Now you're gonna need to be careful with this because what you don't wanna do is say, what do you want for breakfast? Because when they say, a hot fudge sundae, that might not be okay. So instead of offering wide open choices, give limited choices such as, would you like Wheaties or Cheerios this morning? Would you like waffles or scrambled eggs? You can ask them, do you wanna wear your green shirt or your blue shirt? But always give them choices. Every choice gives them a sense of power and having a sense of power can help with behaviors tremendously. And the third thing was establishing rules and boundaries. And these are not just to keep everybody else safe, but so that this child feels safe as well. Let this child know that they're safe in your home and establish rules and boundaries within your home that will keep everybody safe. So following those three things, nurturing activities, 
providing choices and establishing rules and boundaries are going to be great ways for you to set up a safe and healing home for these kids. Now I know that we've given you a lot of information today and what I'd like to do um, in closing actually is to leave you with what I would consider some characteristics of successful caregivers for children with sexual behavior problems. These are foster parents who possess or learn um, the attitudes and skills that are necessary to be effective therapeutic foster parents. There are also people who are willing and able to work as a team with other treatment team members. They can express their concerns and their viewpoints. They can obtain information. They listen well to other viewpoints. They come to agreements about recommendations and consistently carry out those treatment plans. This might mean that sometimes you need to accept or implement recommendations that might differ from your own personal beliefs. These people are also um, able to accept that the child has attachment to their birth family, which may mean to the abuser. These foster parents are people that are aware of that their own experience, their own history, and their triggers, and how these may clash with the child's experiences, histories, and triggers. A successful foster parent will address the emotional impact of parenting challenging children. They're willing to ask other people for help. They identify and they practice ways of relieving their own stress. They recognize which interactions and when those interactions may not be healthy for the child. They can talk about controversial issues such as sexuality, pregnancy, sexually transmitted diseases. They recognize and accept the special needs of that particular child. They're able to be non-judgmental, kind, flexible, patient, and empathetic. They're also able and willing to know that healthy sexuality for children is not the absence of sexuality, but rather a movement towards more healthy relationships and behaviors. They're able to remain calm and able to think rather than to react. When a child acts out sexually, they can set limits firmly and they redirect behavior without shaming, blaming, or guilt. And they're also able to create that safe, structured, healing home for the entire family. Thank you very much for watching this video overview of working with children with sexual behavior problems. And remember, the six-hour classroom training on working with children with sexual behavior problems is offered in all regions of the state. And you can find that by going to our website, click on the map for your area, and that will give you a listing of trainings coming up in your local area. In addition, remember to always consult with the child's social worker and the child's therapist whenever working with children with sexual behavior problems. Again, Thank you for watching and thank you for all that you do.